Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the most self-explanatory panel I've ever hosted, uh, diversity and inclusion, what we got wrong and what we learned from it. Here's our panelists. Uh, this will be a quick session, uh, but I hope you find it informative and uh, thought-provoking. Um, so on stage, we have uh, diversity and inclusion leaders from three prominent uh, tech companies. And Sarah, I'll introduce you briefly. Uh, this is Damien Hooper uh, Campbell, VP and Chief Diversity Officer from eBay. Uh, Danny Gilroy, over there, uh, Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with Dropbox, and uh, Annie Jean-Baptiste. Jean-Baptiste? Yes. Jean-Baptiste? Great. Um, <laughs> Google's Head of uh, Product Inclusion uh, Research and Activation. And to my immediate left is uh, Dr. Sarah Saska, co-founder and CEO of Feminuity, a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy firm that works with companies uh, around the world. So uh, set the stage a little bit um, for the audience. Um, uh, in the United States, uh, diversity and inclusion, d and if, if you hear us say that, is already a billion dollar business. Uh, many companies, particularly in the tech sector, have established d &I departments, um, often headed by chief diversity officers. Uh, the U.S. is very much ahead of Canada in this regard. Few, if any, tech companies here have a CDO or a department uh, other than Shopify. A few companies have strategies uh, in that regard, but overall Canada is behind the U.S. Um, so, if the U.S. is ahead of Canada, there's lessons to be learned, uh, good and bad, uh, triumphs and mistakes. So I'm going to uh, ask Sarah to start by kind of setting the scene for us a little bit. Uh, first of all, what's a chief diversity officer and what does that person actually do? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's a wildly misunderstood role, I think even in the U.S. to an extent. Um, well, it's, it's much more than HR. Um, chief diversity officers often kind of get wound up with HR and people leaders, and while that's a piece of it, it's much more expansive. Uh, so CDOs, the role is very much holistic. It needs to touch on every point, every, every part of a business. Uh, they work cross-functionally. So they're, they're dealing with people leadership and HR, of course. They're dealing with product development. They're dealing with finances. They're dealing with physical space. They, they need to be part of everything. Yeah. And tell us a little bit, kind of in a nutshell, what's been the experience in the US, the sort of first wave of, of kind of really leaning into the, the DNI movement. What, 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 what have we seen in terms of results, of, of good and bad? Yeah, uh, I think we've seen a lot of things. Um, one of the, the big pieces is we've seen a lot of leaders who've been sort of put in these roles, but not always empowered in the way that they need to, um, not resourced enough with the people, the teams that they need, um, as well as the authority um, that, they, that they should definitely be having. Um, so hopefully we can start to do that better in Canada. Um, we've also seen a major reliance on diversity reports. So people are running the quantitative data sets without getting sort of the color and texture and really getting into the weeds in those data sets. So, so often organizations, you know, they'll run their survey, uh, but they'll design based on aggregate numbers, when in reality we need to sort of dig into those, get really intentional and intersectional about it to understand how to actually design meaningful solutions. So that's been one thing that I think is starting to get better, though. People have a more... Um, holistic approach to uh, how they're sort of doing their assessments now. Okay. And, and uh, I mean, what would you call sort of the big mistake of, of the, this first era? Oh, gosh. F from my perspective, it seems that diversity, well, it still sort of translates into people, right? We're still referring to people as diverse and that whole thing. People aren't diverse. It's a relational concept. Uh, but in the U.S., we're still very focused on uh, gender identity and, and race when there's, you know, 30 plus other aspects that we need to sort of think about when we're having these conversations. So I'd say that's kind of been something that hasn't been that great, but you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move to the other panelists. So um, start with you, Damien. Um, uh, and the same question for all of you. Um, give us an example of, I mean, each of your organizations has, has made the move into DNI and made the commitment. Uh, tell me about some of the biggest misses, past or present, uh, if, if uh, in your previous job maybe, and kind of what was what were the lesson learned from from the mistakes? Sure. First of all, peace, Toronto. What's going on? Move the <laughs> dial. Yes. Um, so look, one of the things that we got right was we said one size does not fit all. What works for our finance division doesn't necessarily work for our tech division doesn't necessarily work for our Istanbul office, doesn't necessarily work for our, our Salt Lake City office. So we said we're gonna aim to build individualized diversity and inclusion plans for each one of our 10 or so global business units. That we got right. 
we got right, we're gonna get leadership buy-in and we're gonna start with them and we're gonna have them brainstorm and come up with the solutions. We got that part right. We got the cross-functionality right of the whole thing. And then after we were in the kitchen coming up with all these solutions that were bespoke and customized to each one of these business units with leadership buy-in, we forgot to tell people that when we brought this big plan back that looked like a lot, that we weren't trying to do it all tomorrow. Tech is a super fast moving industry. And so when we came back with what I call the platinum plan, some of the same leaders for whom diversity and inclusion and really thinking about it strategically and holistically, for whom this was new, they were floored. And so what we ended up having to do, and that's what we got wrong, is we didn't balance leadership buy-in with managing expectations. And so some leaders went ahead full speed and jumped into it, and other leaders, it was kind of that freeze moment. And so we had to do a lot of work to unpack and to say, hey, look, this, you don't have to do all this in 12 months. Diversity is a long-term journey. Let's unpack it and identify the things that are top priorities. And so the lesson from that was, there's this thing called illusion of transparency, where you're so close to the work and you're so close to the message, you think everybody else gets it just the same way you explain it. And that when we are taking people along in a journey, we have to really take them along in the journey and manage expectations from day one. That's great. Danny, what's your story? Sure. Um, so for us, I think it's a little bit different. Um, we also have really strong support from our leaders at Dropbox. And they went ahead, actually, and set a number of aspirations for both underrepresented minorities as well as women in terms of retention in terms of hiring and in terms of advancement, which is wonderful. To come into a situation like that, to me, um, was a real opportunity. The thing that was missing, though, was what I kind of call the, the change management process. Mm -hmm. So people didn't necessarily know what or how they were supposed to help contribute to these efforts. So you had really inconsistent things that were happening across the organization, some people doing things that were productive, some that were counterproductive, some that weren't doing necessarily anything. Um, so the lesson for us was really understanding what the journey is and how to impact it and where you want to impact it. So what we're doing actually right now is, um, I don't know if any of you are, um, are familiar with um, either customer journey mapping or anything like that, if you've been in a sales organization or something like that. We're actually doing the same thing with the employee experience. So interviewing a number of different personas to see where and when exactly we want to impact people and how we want to touch them because what we're trying to drive is really um, adoption of certain behaviors. So how do you do that? Um, so that was the big learning for us was, um, was setting goals is great, but you have to put in a clear kind of process in terms of how people can contribute. Annie, let's awesome. start. Hi, everyone. Um, I think the biggest um, mistake we've learned from is that you need to think holistically about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? So um, we talk a lot about the three Ps at Google, people, process, and product. And those are inextricably linked, and you can't have one succeed without the others. Um, so when we think about um, how tech has talked about diversity and inclusion. It's been really focused on culture and representation, which are super important, right? But it's to what end? It's because you're building for people who may not look, act, or think like you, and so you really want to build a product for them where they feel thought of and seen, and in order to do that, you have to have a representative and inclusive culture, right? So really starting to think about all of those things at once, I think, is really important, and not um, trying to scramble kind of after the fact and bring one of those things in, because I really do feel those are kind of the three legs of of the stool. And so um, once we started to kind of think about that um, more holistically, I think we saw where there were places where we needed to kind of grow or build more muscle, um, but we were also a lot more intentional, I think, about what the end goal was, right, which was allowing everyone to feel like they could shine and thrive at Google, but also that we wanted all of our users to feel the same way. So that's been the biggest learning. Okay, great. Um, so Damien, you talked about the, the platinum plan, um, yeah. you know, the how do you how do you strike that balance? Like keep the organization kind of aiming at this sort of big aspirational goal yeah. that's maybe a little much for everyone to swallow all at once, while sort of keeping the right pace of this more iterative, you know, little wins and, and advances along the way. Yeah, striking the balance is I think probably an art and a science. 
Um, the learning for me is that it has to happen from the interview process. A lot of people say they want to be in diversity and inclusion and they go and interview with a great company, but expectations aren't managed. And our former CEO, who's the one who created my role, in the interview that I had with him, he said, you've got conditions for success. And I said, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that. He said, one, I'm going to be out front with you all day long. Two, you have resources, to your point. And then three, I know that this doesn't happen in six months. And so what that told me, that's a major reason of why I took the role. What that said to me was that I ha was empowered to make sure that I was always sharing a narrative with the company that said, I don't care how fast we launch apps and we have this uh, ethos of launch and iterate, this is going to be a journey. And then what you have to do once you have that empowerment from the top is, uh, you know, an old boss of mine used to have this saying, repetition breeds retention. You have to be a maniac about telling people over and over and over again this is a journey. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a sense of urgency. It does mean that unlike trying to change a product or trying to change a marketing campaign, you are trying to unlearn behaviors that people have been raised with and have been reinforced year after year after year, and so it's not the same thing. And so, you know, it sounds pretty basic and it isn't rocket science, but making sure that in every step of the way, you are remaining urgent, you're measuring things, but you're helping people to understand that this happens over time, not overnight. One thing I wonder with... Thank you. One thing I wonder with uh, DNI, and, and maybe we saw this with uh, corporate social responsibility a few years ago, is you know companies say, well, we have a, a strategy, and you know you get this uh, initial flurry of you know excitement and buy-in, and then I sort of wonder if it you know if it wanes or or what, what's involved in sort of keeping that fire. So, Danny, what, tell me a little bit about you and your fellow uh, diversity inclusion practitioners. You're steeped in these issues. Uh, you know how important they are. How do you effectively communicate them and the stakes and the pitfalls to other stakeholders around the you know, executive management table who aren't necessarily steeped in them or, or who might say, well, yeah, we, we have you. you know, we, we have a DNI department. What, you know, what else do we need? Like, how, do you, how do you sort of keep the conversation going and make sure that you're translating what you know so, uh, so intimately to the, to the rest of the corporation's decision makers? Yeah, um, so one of the things is to really effectively use the communications channels that are available. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion uh, is a little bit different. I, I consider diversity and inclusion in a lot of ways uh, to be like a movement, frankly speaking, because what you're trying to do is have people start to understand the philosophy and approach and then take things on themselves. Mm. So think about um, the work that King or Gandhi or people like that did and a lot of it was setting a big vision, but it was individuals who actually did things themselves. So I, I think the first thing is, is talking about it over and over again. When we think about the roles that we have, um, part of our role is really evangelizing. I mean, it's really getting people excited about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we do things like we, we on a quarterly basis, do um, all hands that are broadcast to the entire company. We do them at different times to capture all audiences globally. Um, we also have other channels that we use, our, our internal websites, emails, a variety of different things. And next year, we're gonna take it down to another level, which is the locus of the manager, because one of the things that we realized is that not everybody reads everything, not everybody watches everything, but what I always do is I know I interact with my manager, and a lot of times they're becoming kind of the person who, who figures out what information is really urgent for the rest of the team. So making sure that they're getting what they need and providing something that's clear that it adds value to them and their team in some ways, because that's kind of the criteria that they use as they think about what they want to share. Um, so it's really, in fact, one of the things that I did is I went ahead and changed one of the roles on my team to be somebody who's basically in charge of, of communications internally around diversity, equity, inclusion, and thinking about it as, at a strategic level. Annie, you said that uh, diversity and inclusion is not just the right thing to do, there's also a business case for it. I, I can't think of a more compelling reason, uh, something that would get everyone's attention, uh, again, at the, at the board table to say, well, you know, we'll actually make more money by being more uh, diverse and inclusive. Can, can you, uh, Google's kind of a pioneer in this area, I think. Can you uh, give us some, uh, tell us about some of the work you've done and, and maybe give an example where 
you know, embracing DNI has actually resulted in a better uh, product commercially? Sure, yeah. So I think, you know, at the core of all of this work is that everyone wants to feel seen, right? And they want to feel seen by their, the people they love, by their work coworkers. They want to be seen by the products that they interact with each and every day. And so I think just remembering how it's ever felt, if you've ever felt not included and how terrible that feels, that's what we're trying to mitigate, right? And we're doing that as early as we can in the process. Um, and I really feel like there's a misconception that if people are underrepresented, that they don't have power. And that's just simply not true. Right? So I think we need to start to shift the narrative around what underrepresented, diver all of those words, right, does not mean that these people don't have power and brilliance that we need to be bringing into the product design process, right? So there are one billion people in the world with a disability. Black and Hispanic users have trillions of dollars with a T of purchasing power, right? So there's hard data to back this up, and so I think it's really balancing the business case with the human case. Um, one example of that is um, with our Google Assistant, which is a voice assistant assistant in a lot of the products, um, we actually brought a bunch of different Googlers um, from all different backgrounds and walks of life across the globe together to what we call stress test the assistant before it launched. And what that meant was we knew that, you know, myself or an engineer or whoever was working on the product, they're not necessarily going to know what would be offensive or alienating for other communities, right? We always say build for everyone with everyone. And I think the with everyone is really important. And so those um, Googlers came and we call it dog food at Google, so they tested the product. We say, eat your own dog food, um, which is very odd. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they came together, um, they started to test and tell us what they wanted to see, what they didn't want to see, and at launch, um, there were only 38 queries out of billions of queries that actually were so offensive that they had to be acted upon, and that's a testament to bringing underrepresented people to the table at that critical moment to make a product that really works for everyone. So I think that's a pretty good example. That's a cool answer. So, Sarah, I want to come back to you. Um, you've been listening to these answers, and, and again, knowing that Canada is a little bit behind uh, the United States in this area, uh, tell us about some of the key takeaways. We, you know, we think we've heard in the last few minutes, the last two minutes we have on this panel, yeah. and um, you know, for Canadian organizations uh, listening in, in the audience today, are thinking about making moves in this area. What are you know, what are the what are the big things they should be thinking from from this panel? Yeah, I mean shifting beyond sort of just a women first or gender centric approach, right? Understanding that this work needs to be deeply holistic, um, really resourcing folks, supporting them in the efforts, managing the heck out of expectations. Uh, I love the language that you had around that. Um, and yeah, understanding that this is not something that's gonna be done in six months, a year, ever. There is no, no end point to it. Um, and I think for Canadian tech in particular, we really need to think more intentionally about how we're designing our products. Uh, that just seems to be a sort of an even more stark gap uh, from our perspective as well. Yeah. Sean, can I add in one thing um, on, yeah. on the comment that, that you'd made? Um, so I would like what you talked about in terms of the power, in terms of economics that people have that we don't recognize sometimes. Um, I think it's also important from a mindset for us to recognize the power we have because um, I know sometimes tech can be uncomfortable, it can be uninviting, um, but if we don't participate, then we don't ever have a chance to have a stake in the system. Yeah. So it may not be easy to begin with um, for all of us, but I really think we have to be the trailblazers or the people behind us won't be. I assume there are a few women in this room, right? <laughs> okay, right? <laughs> so my goal for, for all of you is for me to eventually work for you. Uh, but to do that, we need you to participate in the system very actively and be successful. All right. Thank you all. That's uh, that's terrific. Very much appreciated. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.